Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du Fred Astaire Revoir un latte coeur. Ronald Reagan's key campaign promises upon assuming the presidency in 1981 was to reduce the size and influence of the federal government and to promote deregulation in order to stimulate the economy. Today, the so-called administrative state, this is what is used derogatorily, is a huge piece of our federal governing system. Under the executive branch, there are 15 departments, the Department of State, Treasury, Interior, uh, Education, Agriculture, Justice, Commerce, uh, they, they go on. And within those departments, there are more than 400 agencies and sub-agencies that employ 2 million Americans. Now, these agencies among other functions, are the regulatory bodies upon which we rely in nearly every aspect of our daily lives. Experts at the EPA regulate pollutants. The Department of Transportation comes up with safety standards for cars and highways. Agriculture makes sure our food is safe. FDA determines the drugs we, we consume. OSHA and the Department of Labor keep workers safe. They protect their rights. This big, complex nation has big, complex systems to keep it running. But for decades, Even before Reagan gave that speech, there have been debates about the size of government and the democratic nature of accountability, often in conservative circles. In 2018, as Trump had already appointed an historic number of federal judges, including his first Supreme Court pick, Neil Gorsuch, who had a long history of opposing federal regulations. The White House counsel, Don McGahn, said in plain terms exactly what the Trump administration was going to do. Quote, there is a coherent plan here uh, where actually the judicial se selection and the deregulatory effect are really the flip side of the same coin. With courts stacked with Trump appointees across the country, the coherent plan was well underway. The Supreme Court has taken up three major cases this term that take aim at the very structure of the so-called administrative state and at the constitutionality of how they function. These cases on their own, but especially together, will call into question the function of our government as we know it. Today, we're focusing on one of those cases, SEC versus Jarkesi. In short, George Jarkesi is a right-wing activist and political commentator who is also a hedge fund manager. He got in trouble with the Securities and Exchange Commission for fraud. The SEC found that he misrepresented how his funds were run, that he paid himself and his partner excessive fees, that he inflated his assets' value. The SEC responded in a very standard way, fining him and prohibiting him from certain kinds of investment work. Jarkissi contested the SEC's ruling, but he didn't stop there. He argued that the SEC's entire regulatory process, including the role of administrative law judges, was unconstitutional. SEC versus Jarkissi and the other two cases taken up by the Supreme Court take aim at the powers of the so-called administrative state and at the very functioning of our government. They attack the constitutionality of how agencies are funded. They attack Congress's ability to delegate responsibilities to the agencies. And they attack the constitutionality of how agencies are allowed to adjudicate matters. 
Just last year, the Supreme Court ruled against the EPA in a decision that severely limited agencies' regulatory power. In that case, the EPA's ability to regulate carbon dioxide. Justice Elena Kagan wrote in the dissent in support of the EPA, saying that the court, quote, does not have a clue. I'll read it here. Does not have a clue about how to address climate change, yet it appoints itself instead of Congress or the expert agency, the decision maker on climate policy. I cannot think of many things more frightening, end quote. The fact that the Supreme Court has even agreed to hear the SEC case and other cases that threaten the administrative state is alarming. It signals the court's appetite to tear down or at least chip away at a crucial check and balance of the American government. Without the full use of these federal agencies, who prevents insider trading? Who makes sure we have clean air and water, that our food is safe to eat, that our roads are up to snuff? And by the way, this whole effort to dismantle the administrative state would hand even more decision-making power and more responsibility to the Supreme Court and to Congress, a Congress that is notoriously incapable of deciding much of anything at the moment. The question is, do we want agencies staffed with experts in their respective fields to design and enforce regulations for how we operate, or do we want Congress and a few appointed judges to make those decisions? These cases do not have the same name recognition or obvious immediate consequences as other landmark cases we've seen this Supreme Court deliver in the last few years, like the Dobbs decision to end the right to abortion or its decision to overturn affirmative action. But these cases cannot go unnoticed. These are cases that have the potential to upend systems upon which we rely to protect ourselves, our water, our economy, our food, and our planet. Joining me now, Melissa Murray, a professor at NYU, co-host of the Strict Scrutiny podcast and an MSNBC legal analyst. Melissa, great to see you. I've talked enough about this, and I don't know if I've done uh, justice in explaining because it's not something that is in the ether. People don't think about the administrative state all that much, regular folks. But this is a a long-term effort to cause one of these cases to, to be successful. And then what happens? What happens if the SEC rules that, yeah, Mr. Jarkissi, you're right, the SEC or the way it handles things are unconstitutional? So first of all, that was an amazing explainer, Ali. Really terrific. And I'm so glad you're covering these cases because you're exactly right. They have floated under the radar, but they have the real potential to completely upend the way government as we know it runs. So the case, SEC versus Jarkissi, involves the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial, as well as some other constitutional issues. The court, in oral argument last week, focused primarily on the Seventh Amendment, which guarantees individuals a right to a jury trial in civil cases. The court had addressed this question of whether a agencies could have administrative tribunals to make determinations of how the laws were followed in an earlier case from 1977 called Atlas Roofing. In that case, the court said that where the circumstances involved common law claims among private parties, those had to be tried consistent with the Seventh Amendment's right to a civil jury trial. However, where the case involves so-called public rights, that is, where the government was enforcing public laws and enforcing the public's rights to compliance with those laws, including the right to fair markets, fair and safe markets, well, then those could be tried in administrative tribunals. And then the parties had the opportunity to have those administrative tribunal determinations reviewed in a federal court. This is the entire crux of what is being challenged in Jarkissi. Mr. Jarkissi was tried by an administrative tribunal, determined that he violated the securities laws and a penalty and fine was imposed. He now challenges that on the ground that it violates his right to a civil jury trial. Atlas Roofing, that 1977 case, would appear to answer this. This is a government bringing the case to enforce public laws and public rights. But the Supreme Court last week seemed really interested in whether or not this was tantamount to government tyranny. And Mr. Jargassi needed someone like this court to step in and enforce his right to a jury trial. And as you note, there's a lot riding on this. Almost every administrative agency has these administrative tribunals for determining violations of the laws that they are charged with regulating. So it doesn't just affect the SEC, it affects a lot of administrative agencies. More importantly, it will have a huge impact on how the SEC enforces the securities laws. Right now, the federal courts are absolutely overburdened, which means that if the SEC wants to enforce securities actions, they're really going to have to triage and prioritize the most important cases that should go 
to the federal courts because right now it's just taking so long to get things through to a jury trial there. So the SEC is going to have to pick and choose, and that means a lot of things may go unenforced, which seems to be exactly what corporate interests want. And and there's an impression for those who are critics of the administrative state that somehow this skips the normal justice system. It skips the normal uh, congressional approval system. But that's not true, because every one of these government departments is populated by people who are congressionally approved. Every one of these agencies is headed by somebody who is congressionally approved. So if you suddenly think the SEC is going rogue or the EPA is going rogue, Congress does actually have recourse in this thing. But they would have you believe that all of these agencies are just in the same way that people criticize the deep state, the administrative state is just its own thing with its own laws. Um, it, in fact, it's got more to do with sort of efficiency and expertise, right? That federal courts are clogged That's exactly right. and, and these are experts. No, that's exactly right. And again, a lot of the things that administrative agencies do, conservatives argue that these things should be done by Congress. But could you imagine mm-hmm. asking Congress right now to make regulations about particulate air matter and, and what's safe for clean water? You couldn't. And more importantly, this whole question of a lack of accountability, especially in the context of the civil jury trial right, really doesn't make sense because these administrative trial tribunals are not the last word. The parties can always appeal the determinations of the tribunals to the federal court. So again, it's not as if this is judge, jury, and execution, executioner. There's a system, and there's, although these agencies are often insulated, they're not completely unaccountable. And in fact, they're actually necessary for the kind of efficiency and efficient government and good government that we're used to. It is Monday, the 4th of December of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the little Yorkie is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special River City Hash Mondays. Because you know it was the weekend and you get hash on Mondays. Okay, And what is a hash? Well, it's what you have left over from the weekend. Make it into a gourmet delight. And we do. Well, what a weekend, huh? Had some football going on, uh, some other things, and uh, and Trump. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David was, early on in his show, was speaking about uh, how we got our weekends back. Remember during the Trump years, it was like the weekends tended to be the worst. There was no days of rest at all during the Trump administration. and I would campaign on that. Do you really want to give up your weekends again? Because uh, something would just dominate uh, the news. And uh, that's what he did. He dominated it and forced it down our throats. So over the weekend... Uh, and this morning, even boy, he's just, they talk about it as a deterioration. Yeah, I guess so. I would say deteriorated, but, uh, it's ongoing. So, uh, I guess it would be a shun then indeed. So, um, he's just come out with any number of crazy projections. You know, whenever he accuses somebody He's doing it. You know, he talks about how corrupt Joe is. That's because he knows that his whole life has been predicated on corruption. When he goes after Hunter, he knows it's because his kids are up to their necks in these crimes. Actually, they're probably in over their heads. So he always blames everybody else for what he is doing. And so he comes out with this diatribe that a second administration of Joe Biden is going to be dangerous for democracy. (laughs) Now, the Nazis did a very similar thing. They took the arguments of their opponents and turned them around and basically did a schoolyard thing. Yeah, but that's what you are. The Nazis were rather adept at it. And apparently, uh, this guy Trump, he's a natural. 
Mm-hmm. And why is he a natural? Well, I suppose if you're going to have Nazi tracks like Mein Kampf on your bedstand for decades, you might pick up a few pointers. You might. I'm curious if he has the audible version of Mein Kampf now. Uh, I wonder. Yeah, and who's reading it? <laughs> Could AI have Adolf Hitler do the audible version of Mein Kampf? I would expect Elon Musk to bring that one out. Yeah. So speaking of Nazis, what the hell is up with this bullshit intifada bullshit? <laughs> Excuse me. If I lose followers, I'm sorry. I don't buy it. It is AstroTurf. The next day, not even the next day of October 7th, it had hardly even been October 8th. The calls for an immediate ceasefire were being bandied about. Massacred 1,200 people. We thought 1,400. They downgraded it to 1,200. Because some of them were taken as hostages. That's why they couldn't find them. So 1,200. Massacred in the most horrendous fashion. That's being memory hold. And if it hasn't been memory hold, it gets excused. Rapes. We have to be measured in our response to that. Really, do we? It's bullshit. And I got to say, it's rather curious to me in this instance. Because I used to, and we all did, kind of make fun of MAGA. They were so easily duped. They were so easily brainwashed. I would argue that this rise of anti-Semitism that is being manifested and encouraged, it sure feels astroturf. But <laughs> what about all the useful idiots and the dupes who just embrace anti-Semitism at a drop of a hat. Now, we've seen the pictures from overnight uh, yesterday during the football game in Philadelphia against uh, my 49ers and their Eagles. It, it, it looks like maybe several hundred people, maybe not that much, but a, a quite sizable crowd surrounded a falafel restaurant by an Israeli American, or is he a Jewish American? Regardless, this guy, this chef, has been one of the proponents, one of the most major proponents of a Israeli-Palestinian peace. And they surrounded his restaurant and chanted, Goldie, Goldie, you can't hide. You are guilty of genocide. The guy has nothing to do with what Bibi Netanyahu is doing. He's an American restaurateur making falafels. Give me an effing break. That is anti-Semitism. It is not anything else than that. And this incident is even the first one. Kelly was... Telling me uh, earlier this morning, as we uh, touched base a little bit, that uh, it looked like uh, the Museum of Natural History the other day. Uh, they tried to get into that to protest with vandalism. It's anti-Semitic. And let us, let us remember exactly what an intifada is. It's to eradicate the Jews. Okay, let's be clear. The Hamas uh, mission statement, their manifesto, their constitution, 
is to eradicate the Jews from the river to the sea. I'm sorry, but I don't buy it. Okay? There are some dark major forces at work here, and there are there's something dark inside our own government. I'm looking at Ben, and I'm looking at Flynn, and I'm looking at the GOP. You got Mega Mike, the preacher of the house, who has wrangled the Ukraine funding to some sort of wacko BS about border policy. They create a problem, exaggerate the problem, and then blame the problem on Joe and us. And then use that just like the Nazis did. Use that as an excuse to give themselves the enabling acts. So we're not going to fund Ukraine because we run out of money at the end of the year and they're going to hand it to Vladimir Putin. When every single one of these GOPers, and I'm not kidding, when the investigations are complete, we're going to find out that pretty much 100% and maybe even Lynn Cheney, Liz Cheney, the Cheney gal, maybe she gave it back. But every single one got laundered Russian rubles. Initially through the NRA. Let's not forget the NRA was infiltrated by Russian spies. Who then went out and red sparrowed and honey potted. (laughs) And now they're back as heroes in Vladimir Putin's Russia. And Butina is now an elected official in the whatever it is, the Duma. She's in the Duma. Equivalent of our House of Reps. She uh, honeypotted Red Sparrow, the Overstock guy. And he's still out there pontificating about the evils of liberalism. What the hell? Okay, got a movement to get rid of no fault divorce. What 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 is all this BS? All at once, this is not grassroots; it's astroturf. We know it, and I swear to God, the people who fell so easily to it, I think maybe harbored a little bit of that darkness that they didn't really work out. Surrounding a Jewish chef's falafel restaurant, a person who is well known as being a major proponent for Israeli-Palestinian peace and actively worked at it, is surrounded and accused of genocide? Bullshit. And this term genocide, that's all Bannon, Stephen Miller, Mike Flynn bullshit. There's no genocide going on. It's a terrible act of war. Bibi Netanyahu is a war criminal, and he will be judged accordingly. And we will see to it. Getting rid of Hamas is not getting rid of the Muslim world. Okay? Let's be clear about that. But Hamas has to go. There's no getting around it. They were the ones who broke the ceasefire on October 7th and then immediately said, ceasefire now. Please, let us not fall so quickly into this agitprop. (sighs) Okay, well... What do we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous, it is fabulous Monday, River City Hash Mondays. 
Well, starting off in the Bistro Cafe, the Supreme Court's ruling on the Security Exchange Commission case could upend government as we know it. And uh, I thought that was put out pretty succinctly there on that clip. On the rest of the menu, even though DeSantis's lawyers admitted his personally drawn gerrymander map violated the state constitution by diminishing black votes, the Florida First District Court of Appeal ruled it's all good. He had to. He had to. A Wisconsin man pled guilty to firebombing the office of a prominent anti-abortion group last year. And a Barbie doll honoring Cherokee Nation leader Wilma Mankiller is met with mixed emotions. After the break, we move to the chef's table where... Vice President Kamala Harris engaged in a speed round of diplomatic talks with Arab leaders while also negotiating at the COP28. Wow, such genocidal behavior, huh? And a former American diplomat who served as U.S. ambassador to Bolivia has been arrested in a long-running FBI counterintelligence investigation accused of being a secret agent for Cuba. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln and we thank her for doing so. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page to the left from that chat room link is the link to our Patreon page and I got to tell you, we, we need some help. We really do. If you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink once a month, thus becoming a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help. Uh, pay, uh, oh, I'll well, put a big dent in paying the bills and all the other costs that are accrued in running this powerhouse of resistance. So if you, once again, could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink, uh, that will help us fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many, many years ago. But all kidding aside, this time of year is when uh, uh, some of the larger bills come in because they want us to pay for the full year, which is a better deal in the long run. So we look for the better deals. But thank you for your generosity in these many years and allowing us, as I said, to fulfill our our civic duty and also thank you in advance to those of you who might be so generous in the near well the present to the near future so i don't know thank you anyway we need the help uh let's see oh if you want to follow netroots radio on twitter mastodon spoutable blue sky facebook you can do so at netroots radio tom takes care of all of those except for facebook because Kelly takes care of that. But thank you, guys. And you can follow me on all those social media platforms and more by going to mostly at Justice Putnam or simply Justice Putnam. Now, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, that way you are able to read the actual articles by the actual reporters. And that's important. Because sometimes we abbreviate and sometimes we add for, I don't know, literary punch, entertaining value. We'll see. Anyway, uh, you can quickly access the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's by following my social media feed. Okay. Also, if you wanted to uh, follow the show on Twitter, it's just a placeholder as it is. 
but uh, you can do so at Cookbook West. But most importantly, if you could uh, f- pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found, that would be lovely. It really does help, and we, we put them out there for you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you won't be able to find podcasts on Stitcher. Okay? You just can't. All right, I got that off my chest once again. I do it every day. Have to get it off my chest every day. All righty, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays is by Andrew Pantazzi. Pantazzi? I'm sorry, Andrew. Andrew Pantazzi from the Florida Tributary. A Florida appeals court upheld DeSantis's congressional redistricting map, finding a lower court should have dismissed a lawsuit challenging North Florida's districts. Even though DeSantis's lawyers admitted his map violated the state constitution by diminishing black voter power, the first district court of appeal said state voting protections should not apply to a Jacksonville to Tallahassee congressional district ordered by the Florida Supreme Court last decade. The plaintiffs have already filed an appeal to the Florida Supreme Court. The state's highest court is not required to take up the case. In 2021, DeSantis vetoed an earlier attempt by the Florida legislature to comply with anti-gerrymandering protections in the state constitution, arguing one of those protections, the non-diminishment clause, violated the U.S. Constitution by protecting black voters' ability to elect candidates of their choice. Instead, he replaced the map with one of his own, which created whiter, more Republican districts in North Florida. Now, Friday's decision was 8-2 to two in favor of upholding DeSantis' contested districts and striking down the lower court decision. Three judges recused. The new ruling went so far as to say two of the last decade's Supreme Court rulings should not be considered binding precedent. Jacksonville Democratic State Senator Tracy Davis said in a statement, the gerrymandering process was a disservice to the people of Jacksonville. Protected districts were created to give minority voters the chance to have a representative that represents their interests, she said. And that chance has been unceremoniously stripped by the legislature and the courts in 2010. 63% of Florida voters codified anti-gerrymandering protections into the state constitution as the Fair Districts Amendments. Parts of those protections included copied language from Section 2 and Section 5 of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Last decade, the Florida Supreme Court decided that it should apply those protections the same way they're applied federally. The protections included a non-diminishment provision that barred the state from reducing the number of districts that allow voters from racial minority groups to elect their preferred candidates. That the First District Court of Appeals said simply makes no sense because Florida's constitutional language was not as expansive as the Federal Voting Rights Act, which included a requirement for some jurisdictions to pre-clear voting changes through the U.S. Department of Justice. The state should not apply the non-diminishment protection the same way. And the lower court said the Florida Supreme Court was just wrong. Instead, the court decided... The non-diminishment protection should be applied similarly to a separate, different provision of the Voting Rights Act, which requires a more difficult test before it can apply.
Norm Van Wiesen of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Wisconsin man pled guilty on Friday to firebombing the office of a prominent anti-abortion group last year. Hrindindu Roya Chowdhury, age 29, admitted to throwing two Molotov cocktails through the window of Wisconsin's Family Actions Madison office on May 8th of 2022, less than a week after the leak of a draft opinion suggesting the Supreme Court's intention to overturn its 1973 Roe v. Wade decision legalizing abortion. One of the Molotov cocktails thrown into the office, failed to ignite. The other set a bookcase on fire. Rao Chowdhury also admitted to spray-painting the message, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either, on the outside of the building. No one was in the office at the time. Let me just make it clear. Terrorism in any form is just wrong. Don't do it. Final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. An iconic chief of the Cherokee Nation, Wilma Mankiller, inspired countless Native American children as a powerful but humble leader who expanded early education and rural health care. Her reach is now broad- broadening with a quintessential American honor. A Barbie doll in the late man killer's likeness as part of Toymaker Mattel's Inspiring Women series. A public ceremony honoring man killer's legacy is set for Tuesday tomorrow in Telequa in northeast Oklahoma, where the Cherokee Nation is headquartered. Man killer was the nation's first female principal chief, leading the tribe for a decade until 1995. She focused on improving social conditions through consensus and on restoring pride in their native heritage. She met with three U.S. presidents and received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. She also met snide remarks about her surname, a military title, with humor, often delivering a straight-faced response. Mankiller is actually a well-earned nickname, she said, and she died in 2010. All right, let us now go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, no clothes for the emperor. The question I had when I first heard about Ridley Scott's Napoleon Project was, well, how long or how many parts is this going to be? The French revolutionary turned dictator turned emperor was version 1.0 of the modern era's several rogue heads of state, and his story has been rendered by everyone from serious academics to cartoon makers. So the next question becomes, what's going to be new and fresh here, or at least entertaining? Well, turns out, not much, despite its moments. Scott can execute action sequences, and the battles depicted here, especially Austerlitz, are some of the best you'll ever see. 
But scenes don't make a movie, especially with one as broad a mission as Napoleon, where the effort is being undertaken to examine the breadth of his life. Joaquin Phoenix is the lead, and his abilities are not to be questioned, but it's unclear what he's being asked to do here. He's a daring commander, but an uneven strategist, has unparalleled charisma, which we get to see in like one 30-second scene, but is a maladroit lover. On screen, he looks mostly perplexed. This decent support here, especially from Vanessa Kirby in the more focused role of Josephine, at age 86, it might be too late for Scott to make the switch, but a streaming series may have allowed for more in-depth and nuanced explorations of some of the Cliff Notes history that flies by here. That format wouldn't likely get as easy a pass on historical accuracy or even its weirdly, barely French look. Supposedly the phrase, the emperor has no clothes, originated in the Napoleonic era. Perhaps this would have been a better title for this one, which lands not quite darkly funny enough for farce, but not serious enough for PBS. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Gaines. Even if you are a safe, experienced driver, accidents can happen at any time. Young children are especially at risk for injury and death in a motor vehicle crash. Dr. Aaron sauber is a researcher with CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. She's joining us today to discuss the importance of keeping children properly restrained in motor vehicles. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Thank you. Aaron, how many children are killed or injured each year in a motor vehicle crash in the U.S.? In 2013, 638 children aged 12 and under died in a crash, and over 127,000 were injured. How effective have child safety seats and other safety devices been in preventing injuries and death among children? Car seats and booster seats are very effective at preventing injury and death in a crash. But the most effective seat is the one that parents use to buckle their kids on every drive. Where's the safest place for children to ride in a car? The back seat is the safest place for children to ride in a car, buckled in an age and size appropriate car seat, booster seat, or seat belt. How long should a child ride in a safety seat? Children should use a car seat until they're at least five years old and a booster seat until the adult seatbelt fits properly. The adult seatbelt fits properly when the lap belt lays across the upper thighs, not the stomach, and the shoulder belt lays across the shoulder, not the neck. Erin, where should parents go in their community to get help installing and using car seats? Parents can get one-on-one -on -one help free of charge from a certified child passenger safety technician. You can find a tech near you at CERT, C-E-R-T, dot safekids dot org and click on Find a Tech. Another option is to check with your local police or fire department. Erin, where can listeners get more information about restraining children properly in motor vehicles? Listeners can go to cdc.gov and type in the search box, Child Passenger Safety. Thanks, Erin. I've been talking today with CDC's Dr. Aaron sauber about the importance of keeping kids safe in a motor vehicle. Remember, for children under the age of 13, properly restrain them in the back seat. If you're unsure about how to install or use car seats, check with your local police or fire department. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Robert Gaines for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What, did he balance on that big chair? Or... Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. 
Brought to you by the Ad Council and N Family Fire. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Senator Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma wants to go back to the good old days when men were men. I'm Bill Newman. This is the Civil Liberties Minute, and that was the beginning of a recent editor's letter in The Week magazine, which continued after When Men Were Men, quote, and members of Congress routinely pummeled each other into bloody oblivion. What prompted this comment was, of course, the recent hearing where Senator Mullen, who, having taken umbrage at a social media post by the witness, Teamsters President Sean O'Brien, challenged the witness during his testimony to a fist fight, yelling at him to, quote, stand your butt up. The committee chair, Senator Bernie Sanders, gaveled the would-be pugilists into submission by insisting to Senator Mullen that he was, after all, and we quote, a senator. After the brouhaha, Senator Mullen refused to apologize and noted to Fox News that duels and brawls among federal elected officials were not uncommon in Washington in the 1800s and suggested that fistfights today might help restore respect for Congress. The senator's post-hearing remarks did not mention that the United States Senate, not so long ago, was often referred to as the world's greatest deliberative body. The Senate as the world's greatest deliberative body. Now, that, may we suggest, would be the good old days. And we can all hope that those good old days are not gone forever. This Uncivil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. In November 2022, Michigan voters passed a constitutional amendment enshrining voting protections and expanding ballot access. Throughout 2023, the legislature codified these mandates and passed additional reforms, making Michigan one of the year's democracy bright spots. Proposition 2 mandates nine days of early voting, postage for mail-in ballots, a permanent absentee voter list, protections for both voters and election workers from harassment, and a tracking system for absentee ballots. It allows for the funding of secure drop boxes and the counting of military and overseas ballots if postmarked by Election Day. It clarifies that only ballots cast determines election outcomes, only the election board certifies that outcome, and that audits are supervised by the Secretary of State, not third parties. The pro-voter legislature, backed by a democracy-friendly governor, implemented most of those mandates this year. But Bolts Magazine reports that legislators went even further. Automatic voter registration was extended to additional state agencies and tribal nation offices, including the first U.S. law to automatically register formerly incarcerated citizens. Governor Gretchen Whitmer has yet to sign two bills allowing same-day registrants to vote without using provisional ballot status and to allow 16- and 17-year-olds to register early. Early. We have a link to the Bolts Magazine article and Michigan's model legislation at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1946. That was the day federal judge T. Allen Goldsboro fined John L. Lewis $10,000 and the United Mine Workers $3.5 million. In what was characterized as a roaring courtroom scene, Lewis rose to challenge the judge to find him whatever he wanted. The judge had just found Lewis and the UMW in contempt of court for ignoring his November 18th order to head off a soft coal strike, then in its 14th day. Judge Goldsboro had replaced his order with a temporary injunction after the government demanded a judgment that the strike was illegal and must end. Goldsboro ruled the strike was, quote, an evil, demonic, monstrous thing that meant hunger and cold, unemployment and destitution, a threat to democratic government itself. He insisted he was a friend of labor, but that Lewis should be sent to prison. UMW Chief Counsel Welly K. Hopkins snapped back defiantly stating that the government was seeking to break the union politically, financially, and morally. 
The federal government had seized the mines in May and was now threatening to run them with Army engineers if Lewis didn't order miners back to work. AFL, CIO, and Railway Brotherhoods all rallied to Lewis's defense. The Detroit labor movement vowed a 24-hour general strike in support. But by the 7th, Lewis retreated, ordering miners back to work until March 31st. Facing the real threat of the Supreme Court action to uphold the $3.5 million fine, Lewis stated he wanted the court to, quote, be free from public pressure superinduced by the hysteria and frenzy of an economic crisis. Lewis and the UMW were tied up in appeals court for months while they attempted to negotiate new contract terms. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 51 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly the same as yesterday. Mostly cloudy skies during the day, winds light and variable should get a little bit of more rain. And we did have quite a bit of rain over the weekend. And uh, we have a small drying out period, which will only last several hours. And uh, then we'll begin um, another spate of pretty good, steady, if not heavy rain, bringing with it quite a bit of inches over the course of the next week. Cloudy skies tonight, lows in the mid-40s, winds light and variable. Then mostly cloudy skies tomorrow with a smattering of rain, highs around 60, winds light and variable. Pollen is rated as none here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 24 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at level 1. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.19 inches. Visibility is at 7 miles, and relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 45 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 47 degrees with rain, though they are under a snow and ice advisory for their nighttime period. Rome is 52 and partly cloudy, and they have a thunderstorm watch. Bagram is 41 and clear. Kiev is 27 degrees and cloudy. Hong Kong is 70 and fair. Tokyo is 45 and partly cloudy. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 64 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 55 with fog and a beach hazard advisory. Do not turn your back on the ocean. There are sneaker waves. And uh, looks like a higher tide, too, as well. Chicago, Illinois is 38 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 52 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Will Weissert of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
Vice President Kamala Harris engaged in a speed round of diplomatic talks with leaders on Saturday, where she focused on shaping the outlook for a post-conflict Gaza, while calling on Israel to do more to protect Palestinian civilians from the devastating bombardment. She made a hastily planned trip to the United Arab Emirates as the top American representative at the U.N. Climate Conference, but the Israel-Hamas war was a main objective of her visit. She met with leaders from the UAE, Egypt, and Jordan and spoke by phone with Qatar's Amir. Her efforts to focus on what Gaza will look like once the fighting ends played out against a backdrop of an overpowering attack that Israel has unleashed on the crowded southern area of the territory since fighting resumed Friday morning after a week-long truce. I should add, once again, it was Hamas who broke the truce. So let's be clear about that. Uh, Dubai is the first Arab nation to host a... annual U.N. environmental gathering where world leaders discuss ways to best slow the effects of climate change. Harris said she had productive talks at on the summit sidelines with Middle Eastern leaders. She said uh, that she and President Joe Biden have repeatedly noted the brutality of the Hamas attack against Israel on October 7th that triggered the war while also hailing a recent pause in fighting to enable the release of more than 100 hostages taken by Hamas. The vice president said that at some point the fighting will draw to an end and a plan must be ready for what comes next. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles. Rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Joshua Goodman and Eric Tucker of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. A former American diplomat who served as U.S. ambassador to Bolivia has been arrested in a long-running FBI counter-intel investigation accused of secretly serving as an agent of Cuba's government. Manuel Rocha, age 73, was arrested in Miami on a criminal complaint, and more details about the case are expected to be made public at a court appearance today, Monday. The Justice Department accuses Rocha of working to promote the Cuban government's interests. Federal law requires people doing the political bidding of a foreign government or entity inside the U.S. to register with the Justice Department, which in recent years has stepped up its criminal enforcement of illicit foreign lobbying. The Justice Department declined to comment. It was not immediately clear if Rocha had a lawyer and a law firm where he previously worked said it was not representing him, and his wife hung up when contacted by the AP. Roach's 25-year diplomatic career was spent under both Democratic and Republican administrations, much of it in Latin America during the Cold War, a period of sometimes heavy-handed U.S. political and military policies. His diplomatic postings included a stint at the U.S. interest section in Cuba during a time when the U.S. lacked full diplomatic relations with Castro's communist government. Born in Colombia, Rocha was raised in a working-class home in New York City and went on to obtain a succession of liberal arts degrees from Yale, Harvard, and Georgetown before joining the Foreign Service in 1981. 
He was the top U.S. diplomat in Argentina between 97 and 2000 as a decade-long currency stabilization program backed by Washington was unraveling under the weight of a huge foreign debt and stagnant growth, triggering a political crisis that would see the South American country cycle through five presidents in two weeks. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Shouter Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver